Bristol, home to 680,000 people. Bristol is a city rich with diversity and culture. It was actually voted best city to live in in the UK in 2017. And whilst it has a difficult past, it also has moments of incredible spiritual renewal. Here, identified with the city, we have the likes of George Miller, George Whitfield and John Wesley. Men who knew what it was to see God intervene dramatically in the lives of this city and the country more widely. What we believe is that City Church is following that tradition of restoration here in the city. We want to do all we can to be part of the story of helping Bristol believe. Well, good morning and welcome to City Church at Home. My name's James. I'm one of the pastors here at City Church and it's great that you can join us today. We've got a great service lined up uh, this morning with Ash George continuing our series uh, called Being Human. Uh, and we've also got a time of worship where we're going to sing songs together. Uh, there's also some great resources for children and young people that you can access in the link. Uh, below and just to say a particularly warm welcome to you uh, if this is your first time with us we're so glad that you can join us today uh, before we sing uh, some songs of worship i wanted to just help us by by looking at a brief encounter between jesus and what is called or the person is called the rich young man in matthew chapter 19 in which this young man comes to jesus and says teacher what good thing must i do to get eternal life. And Jesus responds to him and says, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Uh, and their, their conversation continues about all the good things that this man has done um, and, and is trying to work out what else he needs to do to get eternal life. And the problem that he faces is that uh, it is not about the good things we do. That's not what the Bible teaches, not what the gospel is. Uh, it's not about being morally right. It is not about being a squeaky clean person. In fact, uh, what Jesus uh, teaches, what the gospel is about, is that there was only one man who was ever good, perfectly good, who never sinned, who was absolutely perfect in every way, and that was Jesus Christ. Uh, and as broken people, as people with weakness, with pe as people with, with sin in our hearts. We needed rescuing, we needed saving. And the one perfect man that walked this earth gave his life on a cross uh, and defeated death and resurrected and ascended into heaven so that we as broken people might know a good and faithful and loving God. And he chooses to pour his love into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, we can come to him, not because we're good, but because he's chosen us and because he loves us and because he made a way for us to know him despite our sin. So you may this week have had a bit of a bad week. Perhaps you've messed up in some way. Perhaps you feel guilty or a sense of shame on you. And sometimes that can prevent us from coming to God and yet the gospel says, no, that's exactly the condition that you need to come to God in. Uh, a condition of brokenness, knowing our sin and our deep need for Jesus. That is how we come to God. And so I just want to encourage you that as we sing these songs, as we worship, as we hear Ash preaching, I, I encourage you to express your thanks and your worship to God to this good God who has chosen you, who loves you, and despite your sin, has rescued you and given you a new life. 
So let's worship this good God today. chapter 8 it says this for I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord over the past few weeks I've personally begun to feel quite worn down by this season by both the isolation of 
lockdown and also the divisiveness that seems to be in our culture, um, particularly at the moment. But I find great hope and courage in passages like this in the Bible, where the author is convinced, and I am convinced, that there's nothing in this world that can isolate or divide or separate us from the love of God. And the reason for that is, as he says at the end, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's love for us is not in question uh, because we trust in the saving work of Jesus. We trust in his death on the cross that made a way for us to know him as Father and to receive his spirit at work in us, which helps us to know these things uh, deep down uh, and to trust in these things. And like the author here, to be convinced of these things, to take courage in them. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. In the garden, he said, No, my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but shed drops of blood for mine. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song ever me how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me and with the ransom in glory his face I at last shall see to be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me how marvelous how wonderful is shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me Spirit of 
of God for fresh on us. We need your presence, your kingdom come, your will be done on as in heaven, Spirit of God, for fresh on us, we need your presence, your kingdom come, your will be done, here as in fresh on us we need your presence your kingdom come your will be done here as in heaven oh pray the name of the Lord our God on oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord oh Lord our God on oh, praise his name of the Lord our God, oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing your praise, oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in our homes to worship you. Lord, we just want to take a moment right now to express our thanks to you, our gratitude to you for revealing yourself to us, that we might have the opportunity to know you more and experience uh, what it means to know you personally. Lord, we thank you for every good thing that you've given to us. We pray, Lord, that as we now hear from your word, Lord, that we would discover more and more of what it means to be truly human, to be made in your image. Help us, Lord, we pray that this word would transform us, change us into your likeness. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to hear a few updates uh, from the life of the church in City Life. Hi everyone, Tim here. Before we hear from Ash, I wanted to update you on a few things happening over the next few weeks. We want to let you know that you'll be able to sign up to be part of a connect group from today. With a wide range of groups happening online during the autumn term, it's going to be a great way to stay connected, build relationships and grow in your faith. You can explore the range of groups online and sign up today. Groups will start on Monday the 14th of September. Secondly, we wanted to encourage everyone who calls City Church their home to give regularly according to their income. The Bible teaches that giving financially is an important part of our worship. If you'd like to give, particularly if you are new to the church, then please go to citychurch.org.uk forward slash give where you'll see all the ways that you can make your contribution. One final thing from me, normally at this time of year we are camping with our family of churches called Commission and although this year's Connect Festival has been postponed, there is an online special event happening tonight from 7pm. We'll be hearing from Guy Miller who oversees our family of churches and will be an opportunity to connect with others from around the globe. The link can be found in the Thursday email. It won't be one to miss. Don't forget, the best way to stay connected with City Church is to follow us on social media and tune in with the City Daily videos. That's everything from me. Over to you, Ash. Hello, 
everyone. How should we then live? Those words form the title to a, a 20th century book written by a man called Francis Schaeffer. Now, Schaefer was a man who knew God and loved God. He was a, an avid reader of the Bible. But Schaefer was also a student of modern Western culture. And he worked really hard to understand the Bible on the one hand and his culture on the other hand. And Schaefer did so because he, he wanted to come to a place where he could answer that question. How should we then live? What does it look like to be a human in my culture, in my time, in my place? And in fact, the answer to that question can be varied. A lot of it depends on where and when you live. But there are some foundational elements to humanity, some foundational elements to life that we're actually going to find in our passage today. So let's read together. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 9 to 12. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. How should we then live? Well, you know, in life, there are many things which go without saying. They are self-evident. So a packet of peanuts may contain nuts. A floor may be slippery when wet. These things, we think they, they kind of go without saying, don't they? But I have a conviction, I believe it is a biblical conviction, that important things ought to be said. And I believe that the writer here, Paul, has some important things to be said. And there are three things which I think will serve us well. Though we're removed from these circumstances by nearly 2,000 years, I think they apply uh, very strongly to us today. So let's consider the first important thing that Paul has to say. And that is that we are to love one another more and more. You know, Paul, um, I think, is, is fantastic in his writings, but particularly here as he writes to this church in Thessalonica. I get the feel almost of, of in, it sounds a little bit like an athletics coach. Now, I um, spend a bit of time uh, coaching uh, at my local athletics club, and it's something that I enjoy, um, something that gives me great joy and delight. But as I read these words, I'm getting a sense of Paul sounding almost like an athletics coach here. You see, as a coach, often what I'm wanting to do, as I'm observing an athlete, as I'm observing their, their technique, as I'm observing their form, oftentimes I'm wanting to, to look and I wanted to affirm the good. I wanted to recognise what they're doing, the good things that they are doing. And I wanted to encourage them in those things. But not only am I wanting to affirm the good, I'm often wanting just to challenge for a little bit more. I can see that an athlete is on the right track. They're doing the right thing. But I often know just with a little bit of a tweak or a little bit more effort or energy, they can get a little bit more. And I wanted to just challenge them a little bit. And I think that's what we get here with Paul. You know, a coach is often working to a, a technical model. So whether that is a, a triple jump or a discus throw, maybe a coach, you know, in my mind, oftentimes I will, I will um, have a particular picture of the perfect jump or the perfect throw. I know what it looks like or I know what it ought to look like. So oftentimes as I'm observing an athlete, I'm comparing what I see with what I know to be the perfect technical model. And as a coach, what I'm wanting to do is to get that athlete from where they are to where they ought to be or where they could be. And now here for the Thessalonican church, if we're just kind of considering this analogy of Paul being an athletics coach, for this church in Thessalonica, their model when it comes to love is in fact God himself. The model for every Christian, every follower of Jesus is Jesus. That's what it means to follow Jesus. He is our model. He is our goal. He is what we are aiming for. And Paul is saying to these guys, look, um, 
You have no one, you have no need for anyone to write to you when it comes to love, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. So he's saying that not only is God uh, the goal or, or the model, but God himself is actually the coach. It's as though Paul is looking on and saying, well, um, <laughs> you've been taught by the best here. It is clear that God has got his hand on you. It is clear that this, this love that is emanating, that is springing out from you, does not come naturally. It is clear that God himself has taught you. God has taught you by the scriptures his very own words, but God has taught them also experientially what it looks like to love. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is saying that these guys are exemplary. It's that their reputation reputation went ahead of them, went before them. They were known for their love. How fantastic would that be for us as a church, City Church Bristol, to be known for our love? For you to bump into the average person in the city of Bristol and just mention the name City Church Bristol and for them to respond, oh yeah, that's a bunch of loving guys in that church, full of love. You know, Jesus actually said to his disciples, his friends, he said um, before, he, um, before he died on the cross, before he ascended to heaven, he said to them that um, basically the world will know that you belong to me, that you are one of mine by looking at your love for one another. It is a distinguishing mark or feature of the Christian, of the church. And it is at the heart of what it is to be human. We are to be a loving people. But you know, true, genuine, Holy Spirit empowered love in a church is potent. And I'm, I'm stood here in my kitchen. I spend a lot of time here in the kitchen. And um, often my approach, my perspective, um, when it comes to herbs and spices, is well, if you're going to put some herbs and spices in a dish, um, they ought not to be subtle. You know, I, I, if it's going to be in there, I want to know that it's there. I want it to be potent. And when it comes to love, true Holy Spirit empowered love in a church is potent. You cannot miss it. It cannot be hidden. So we ought to be growing in love. This is potent love which cannot be hidden. But it's love, it, 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 there's, there's something else about it. Now, oftentimes in the Bible, there are, you know, there are many metaphors used to describe the church. So occasionally you'll hear the church referred to as the body of Christ. Elsewhere, you might see it referred to as the bride of Christ. And these pictures, these, these metaphors give us a bit of an inkling of the relationship between Christ and his church. They tell us that it's not the case that Jesus is way up there in a corner in heaven and we're way down here doing our own thing by ourselves. But in fact, there is a, an, an intimate, mystical um, connection and union between the two. We are intimately connected with one another. There is a oneness. And it's often the case, isn't it? So, for example, if you were to be um, uh, uh, driving in a car with other people, the reality is wherever the car goes, you all go. And that is the reality of the relationship between the church and Jesus. It's not that something happens to him over here and it does not affect us or vice versa. We are affected by one another. And both of those, um, those pictures, they, they speak about oneness or union with Christ. You know, the reality is this, that the Christ is the definition of love. He is the definition and the source of love. In fact, if you, you want to know about the greatest act of, of love uh, ever performed, you don't need to go to uh, Spotify to, to list a whole num number of love songs or uh, to have a look at Netflix for the latest love movie. Um, in fact, the greatest act of love ever performed, ever done, was by Jesus himself as he gave himself, as he uh, died sacrificially on a cross for our wrongdoing, for our sin. If you want to know what love is, you would do no better than to look at the person of Jesus. His love is immense. His love, in fact, is infinite. He is the source and the fount of all love. Therefore, the Christian, the church, which is intimately connected with that Jesus, is a body of people who receive that love. We are a body of people who are connected into the source and are ever growing in that love. And this is both a challenge and an encouragement, can I just say? You see, because it's a description of what God is doing, 
We are connected to Jesus, therefore we are growing in love. But it is also an exhortation to join in with what God is doing, i.e. to grow in love. You know, in the midst of the pandemic, we are... um, we're aware that actually this this virus spreads partly through proximity. So we are encouraged to distance from one another. Well, when it comes to, to love or the, the, you know, the, the, the love of God or us growing in our love as people, well, it, it's almost like the opposite is true. We actually want to get closer. We want to get closer to Jesus. It is proximity with Jesus that increases this, uh, the, the, his love within us and out of us. Again, part of what it is to be human is to be in relationship with Jesus. I, ho- I hope you, you've heard that over the past couple of weeks. There's a consistent thread there. That part of the essence of humanity is, is us living in right relationship with Jesus, who is the fount and the source of all love. So Paul has something really important to say, and that is that we are to grow uh, in love for one another. But Paul, he doesn't just want to stop there. Because this, this church, yeah, these guys in Thessalonica, they are exemplary when it comes to love. But there, there is a little bit more going on. There is a little bit more uh, uh, work to be done. And going back to our uh, athletics analogy, in athletics, we talk about the, the ABCs, agility, balance and coordination. Now, an athlete could make some serious gains when it comes to agility, but if that is not matched by their balance and their coordination, that athlete will struggle. They will struggle to perform well. In fact, they they are liable to injury. They need to be solid in agility and balance and coordination. And a, a similar thing applies when it comes to the church. You see, a, a major problem for the church historically has been the sending of uh, mixed messages. A major problem for the, for the church historically has been, for example, on the one hand, people will hear about a God of love and he is, he is the definition of love. Absolutely. But sometimes that message is not matched by the lived experience of some people who come into contact with church. Some people might feel like they experience actually a, a, a community that isn't full of love or of grace towards them. People will hear about Jesus as being, um, as being humble and self-giving. And then sometimes their experience, again, of, of, of maybe some church leaders is of being uh, unkind and uh, uh, manipulative and greedy. The sending of mixed messages. So it's like you can, be, you can be strong in one area and weak in another. And when it comes to Jesus and the gospel, um, a mixed message, in fact, is a false message. It is not a consistent message. I think... You know, Paul, and probably more importantly, God, is, is interested um, in the state of our hearts, our disposition towards him and towards others. He is interested in, in, in the words of our mouths, what we actually say, but he's also interested in the activity of our lives. And we have to get this right. The Thessalonians had to get this right. Paul was concerned about them not getting this right. These guys were so, and, and rightly so, they were very passionate for Jesus They gave themselves to prayer and to worship. They were expectant and excited about the return of Jesus as we ought to be, absolutely. But Paul had detected a bit of a concern, a bit of an issue. And that was that they were so focused on the return of Jesus, so focused on prayer and fasting and worship, that actually their their lives on the ground, their everyday lives, were maybe slightly out of kilter with the reality that they were communicating. And um, Paul does what any, again, what any good uh, coach, uh, I suppose, or pastor or leader would do. And he brings a little bit of, uh, uh, of alignment. He brings a little bit of adjustment. It's like you've got this love thing. You're doing really well on that. You're exemplary on that. But it's just one or two things which might trip you up. So let's just have a conversation and let's work on these things. <clears throat> and these are really important things. And again, you might hear them and think, well, they go without saying. Well, Paul is saying them anyway. And we ought to hear what he has to say to us. So what does Paul uh, say to these guys in Thessalonica? Well, Paul tells them to mind their own affairs. Now, uh, this phrase uh, takes me back to my childhood. When I uh, was growing up in London, oftentimes if, if people would annoy me, um, my, my common retort back was mind your own business. Mind your business. Essentially, what I was saying was um, just, just don't get involved in what I'm doing. Leave me to leave. Let me be, basically. Now, um, I'm glad to say that I've matured a little since and I, I, I don't tend uh, to say that to people anymore. 
Um, but I, I kind of do in a sense that actually, um, in a slightly more mature and gracious way, um, as an athletics coach, oftentimes when I work with a novice or young athletes, um, I'm constantly fascinated about uh, their inability to run in a straight line or the inability to stay between uh, uh, the lines that mark a lane on a track. The lanes are clearly marked all the way through. But oftentimes, in my experience, you get a novice athlete out of there. What happens is they start running and they notice peripheral vision. Oh, that person's getting ahead of me. And then that, their head turns that way. And then they, they're like, well, what about the person on my right hand side? Okay, I turn that way as well. And oh, they're way behind me. And, and all of a sudden they are wobbling here, there and everywhere. And they will struggle. And I often find myself shouting, stay in your lane, stay in your lane. And that's not just because I'm a stickler for the rules, but it, it's also because there is a, the, the reality is where those athletes get unduly affected by what's happening to their left and to their right, they struggle to focus on what they ought to be doing and their performance suffers. If you want a really good example of this, I'd encourage you to have a look at YouTube, the um, men's 100 meter Olympic final from the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. The winner uh, was uh, a certain Mr. Linford Christie. And if you watch that race, if you get a head on shot of, 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 of Linford, uh, what you'll find is from the moment he gets himself into the blocks to the moment he crosses the finish line, his eyes are directly in front of him. He's not looking to the left. He's not looking to the right. He, he barely blinks all the way through. He's utterly focused and devoted to his goal. And I believe that is a, a, a picture really of what the, the Christian ought to be. I think this is what Paul is, is, is wanting to encourage these guys into, is to mind their own affairs. And I don't know the particular you know, context, the particular things that Paul had in mind um, for this church, but I think it might be things that are common to all of us. We can all have the tendency, can't we, to, um, you know, someone, someone else in a church buys a car and you think, oh, okay, that's interesting. I wouldn't have bought such an expensive car myself, or if I did, I would have got a bigger car. Well, you might hear about some people getting into a relationship and you think, oh, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't have gone for her myself, but you know, fair play, well done. Um, we can become so engrossed in the lives of others, particularly in a social media age, we can become so engrossed in the lives of others that we fail to give appropriate attention to our own lives, to the path that Jesus has set for us. And you know, Jesus actually says this in, um, in the book of Matthew. Matthew was a friend of Jesus, wrote an account of his life. Jesus, in interaction with the religious leaders of the time, who were often quite proud, Jesus says this. Look, guys, you are so focused on trying to get the speck of dust out of that person's eye that you fail to recognise that you've got a massive plank of wood in your own eye. First, take the plank of wood out of your own eye. Then, only then, you might just be in a position to help someone else out. You might just be in a position to see well enough to get that speck of dust out of someone else's eye. And actually Paul himself, Paul, uh, he, he had a protege called Timothy. And Paul, as he comes towards the end of his life, he, he knows that his, his, his life is ending. He writes a letter to Timothy and it's essentially his kind of final leadership lessons uh, for Timothy. And what I find fascinating is that among the lessons that, that, that Paul uh, gives, he says this to Timothy, he says, Tim, watch your life and your teaching closely. This is talking to Timothy, a leader, about leadership. And he's saying, Tim, watch your life and your teaching closely. Paul is really clear with Timothy that he has to give appropriate attention to himself. If he's going to serve others, if he's going to lead others, he has to focus on his own life. And consider, is his own life in conformity with the path that Jesus has set for him? And it's a question that I often have to ask myself. It's a question that I ask myself even right now as I'm stood in front of you. I'm trying to help you guys to respond in faith towards Jesus. I have to ask myself that own question. That, that question, does my walk match my talk? Just consider that for a few moments. Does your walk match your talk? We can all become armchair critics of others, can't we? We can all become pundits. You know, whenever the, the World Cup uh, football comes along or the Olympic Games, we, we all become experts on what people should be doing. But the reality is it is a lot, lot more difficult when you are that person on the pitch or in the pool or on the track. Does your walk match your talk? So we are to mind our own affairs. We are to give attention to how closely our lives resemble the life that Jesus has called us to live that's at the heart of what it is to be human.
But Paul also says this. This is the third thing that Paul says. Really important thing for us to hear. And that is we are to work diligently. And I think it's, it's worth at this point just being really clear on what work is. So God is a worker. That, that, that in and of itself ought to blow your mind. God is a worker. God has created everything that you see. God is active in sustaining it all. Even right now, God is a worker. And God has made us to join in with him in his work. Humanity has been given a charge by God to work. Work didn't just come in uh, at the fall as as humanity rebelled against God as a punishment. No, uh, work is actually a good thing. We don't always experience it to be a a pleasant thing uh, at, at the moment. But in its pure original essence, work is a good thing and we are made to work. Humans are to be workers. So therefore there is dignity in work. And you know, you work, it's not so much about whether, you, whether you're paid or not. It's not so much about um, whether you have a particular title or not. It's not so much about whether what you do is seen or not. I think these, we're going to um, hear some words from Timothy Keller, who's an American pastor on work. I, I think this is a bit closer to the, the reality of God's perspective on work. Um, Tim Keller says this, he says, wherever we bring order out of chaos, wherever we draw out creative potential, wherever we elaborate and unfold creation beyond where it was when we found it, we are following God's pattern of creative cultural development. It's all about joining with God's work in cultivating and renewing the earth, whatever that looks like. Whether that looks like being a student in a library pouring over books, whether that, that looks like uh, being a, a parent caring for young children, whether that looks like uh, being a, a baker in a bakery, whether that looks like uh, being someone who collects uh, uh, bins in Bristol, whatever that looks like, it is joining with God's work in cultivating and renewing the earth. And there is therefore inherent value in work. We need to hear that. But what happens when we work? Well, when we work, and Paul says this, we, we, we provide for ourselves. You know, no person is entirely independent, whatever we like to believe. We are interdependent. We have need of one another. And I think the reality is actually in the midst of pandemic that has helped us to realise that in, in a more significant or profound way than we ever had done before. We need one another. But as far as we are able, we work to provide for our needs so that we are not too dependent on others. My wife, Jess, and I have a, a son, Evan, who's nearly three years old. And he's growing, he's maturing, he's slowly taking on more responsibility in life. He's not yet at the point where, you know, he, he, he can sort himself out. He can take himself off to nursery, take himself off the bed, prepare a meal for himself. He's not quite there. But our hope and our expectation is that one day he will get there. We are wanting to train him and develop him and move him in that direction. And that's not because we don't love him. That's not because we just want an easy life and we just want him out of our hair. In fact, because we love him. We're wanting to move him in that direction because we know that's part of what it is to be human, to mature and to grow as a human, is to be someone who takes responsibility for themselves as far as is possible. So when we work, we are able to look after our own needs. We are able to tend to ourselves. And again, not just financially, but just just in life, we are able to look after ourselves. But not only are we there then in a position to look after ourselves, we are also able to provide for others. And I think this tallies really strongly with what it looks like to love. We can have really warm, fuzzy feelings towards people. We can have uh, great and deep affections towards people. But love is is often most clearly expressed in in what we are able to to, to give or to, to do to or for someone, whatever that looks like. Living quietly... Minding your own business, working hard, it sets you up to be able to love others well. And yes, there is there can be a financial element to it. It means that you, you might be in a position to be able to give uh, to others financially, to, to, to bless and be generous in that way. But I think it's more broad than that. You see, when we, when we mind our own business, when we, when we are diligent in our work, actually, it frees us up in other areas as well. It means, for example, if I'm if I'm organised, well organised, well planned, if I work hard, it means I'm able to be generous with my time. It means that when someone is on the, the end of a, a phone or has just dropped a, a text to say that they're, they're struggling and life is hard, it means that I, I'm, I'm not having to kind of retreat into myself and say, I've, I've just got to sort myself out. I might just be in a position to offer a listening ear, just to listen. 
when you live quietly, when you mind your own business, when you work hard, you're actually able also to offer wisdom because you have a life of experience to draw on. You know, God is self-sufficient. He is the only truly self-sufficient one. God gives and gives and gives and gives. It's his default disposition. It's his standard mode of operation is to be a giver. God gives love. He gives gifts. He gives time. He gives talents. He just gives and gives and gives and gives. How should we then live? Well, we, we, leave, we, we live in response to what God has done and what God is doing. See, what happens is we steward those things. So we receive the love of God. We receive the gifts that he has for us. We receive the time that he gives. We receive the talents that he puts into our hands. We receive those things and we give thanks back to God for those things. But we steward things well so that we're in a position to give them away to others. This, my friends, is the heart of what it is to be a human. It, uh, I'm hoping that this has come through really clear over the past couple of weeks in this series, that there is a consistent theme that part of what it is to be human is to be someone who lives in right relationship with God. When we're in right relationship with God, what, that, what, means, what, that, what happens is we, we, are, um, we are receiving love from God. We're receiving, receiving, receiving. And in receiving, we have an abundance and an overflow to give to others. That's part of the essence of what it is to be a human. I, uh, that's part of the essence of what Paul wanted for this church in Thessalonica. He'd recognise that they were exemplary in their love. Doing fantastic in that area. But the, the course of their lives, the, what, what they were giving themselves to, just he, he, he was concerned that that could really um, curtail the, the, the love that they could offer to one another and to the wider world as well. Now, even as I've um, spoken to you this morning, some uh, might be sat there thinking, well, that all sounds fantastic. It all sounds lovely. But the reality is I am struggling at the moment. The reality is I have nothing to give. I have nothing to offer. I am tired. I am angry. I am burnt out. I don't know what the future holds. And I think it's really important for us to recognise that. The danger is at these times we can often feel like, well, what I need to do is I need to muster up love. I need to stir up some love in myself. Or what I need to do is just, I need to sort my life out. I just need to get organized and then all will be good. Can I encourage and challenge you that neither of those responses are the answer? I'd actually want to point you back to God himself. I'd, I'd want to point you back to what I believe is at the core of what it is to be a human. And that is to be in right relationship with God. Before you think about trying to stir up love in yourself, before you think about particular strategies about how you're going to um, love people better and how you're going to organise your life, can I encourage you to reflect on, to meditate on, to saturate yourself in, to delight yourself in the love of God? The Bible from cover to cover is clear on that message. God loves humanity. Actually says it in John uh, chapter three says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. It's not so much that I got myself into, I, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I got myself organized and together and respectable. And then God looked down and thought that guy looks all right. I think I like him. I'm going to set my affections on him. No, that is not the case at all. The Bible is really clear. That is whilst I was still dead in my sins and transgressions that Christ died for me. It's whilst I was turned away from him, complete 180 turned away from him, not interested in him, doing my own thing my own way. Whilst I was in that place, Jesus died for me. Not because he had to, but because he decided to. Out of his own kindness, out of his own generosity. The Bible is clear from cover to cover that God is abundant in love. There is no limit to his love. It's not like... Um, he, he's loved a certain number of people and he's got no love left in himself. He's got plenty enough for all of us. So if you are struggling in terms of um, in terms of love today, can I encourage you to reflect on the love of God? Even if it is, you just go you go to that verse that I just, uh, talked about, John chapter three, verse 16, and just reflect it on that saturate yourself in the love of God because it is is when we are um, abiding in Jesus when we are connected to the source it is then that we are in a position to love and to serve others guys let's respond together I cast my mind to Calvary 
Where Jesus bled and died for me, I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all alone oh pray the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. And on the break of dawn the son of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roll from Christ the King oh praise the sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the name of the Lord We're going to take bread and wine together. And as we do so, um, I, I would love for us to reflect on that reality of the immensity of the love of God. The most significant act of love that the world has ever seen was when Jesus sacrificed himself on a cross, a Roman instrument of torture. And he gave of himself fully for us so that we could come into right relationship with God the Father. Well, not only could we come into right relationship with God the Father, but we could have restored relationship with one another. And it is actually the love of God in us that enables us to love others. So as we take the, the bread together, the bread representing his body broken, as we take the wine representing his blood spilled, let's remember that there is an abundance of love available for each and every one of us. Let us come humbly, Let's come weekly. Let's come as children who receive love from him primarily. We receive before we give. So let's take the bread and the wine together.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we receive from you. You are the truly self-sufficient one. You are the one who gives and gives and gives and gives. And I thank you, Lord, that you did not hold back, but you gave your only son, that who, whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I thank you for that reality. I thank you that we can be in right relationship with you. I thank you that in the love that you give to each and every one of us, we're in a position to love others. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd help us to reflect on the love that you give. I pray that you would stir us, that you prompt us to move, that you'd move us uh, to give out the overflow that we receive from you, that we'd give to others. Heavenly Father, may Christ be honoured, may he be glorified in our words, in our thoughts, in our actions in this coming week. Amen. Well, thanks so much for that, Ash. Uh, and uh, just before we finish, can I encourage you, just maybe at some point today, uh, to to find someone and, and just talk to them about what you heard today. We can so quickly move on. We can so quickly just say, well, that was a nice sermon, and not actually process it with anyone. Uh, and so you might like to ask someone, you know, what did God speak to you today? Or what was something that Ash said that really spoke to you? This morning, why don't you just grab someone that you live with, husband, wife, flatmate, whoever it is, pick the phone up to someone in your connect group and just maybe just check in, ask them how they're doing, but also what, what really struck them about that message. I want to encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, well, that's everything from us uh, today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you do want to find out more about City Church or you want to connect with someone from the team, perhaps you're just looking in and trying to suss suss us out, uh, then can I encourage you to click the Keeping in Touch form uh, down below and someone will get in touch with you. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, alternatively, you can check out our website at citychurch.org.uk. Uh, we also keep our social media regularly uh, updated so you can check us out there. Uh, but we're so glad that you could join us and we hope to see you again next week.